Hello and welcome to the Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I'm Mark Stay. And as always, a huge thank you to everyone who supports this podcast cast by throwing us a few pennies every now and then either on patreon or in the academy if you join the academy you get me and mr d as your tutors and you join an amazing community and you become an absolute superstar uh we've got some evidence of that at the end of the podcast today when we talk about uh, our wins if you want to join the academy go to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com we've got all sorts of courses there all sorts of good stuff to get your book done and out there and for patreon we have a new patron this week which is a gloria thomas thank you gloria for your support and everyone who supports us if you want to support the podcast clues in the word support bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support mr d how are you today i'm doing i'm doing great i'm doing great um i'm excited to hear how your book launch went last night it was fantastic it was re- I, i've got a new staff right let me explain um <laughs> So this isn't this isn't an assistant, I suppose. No, no, to this isn't a object. body of people doing work for me. <laughs> um, this is uh, when I did the end of magic a few years ago. Uh, I, we had a lovely launch, and uh, two wonderful people turned up. One called Merlin, the other called Raven, and they there were other people as, as well. There were other the people, two. yes, yeah. Okay. But they they turn up, they dress up, and they look amazing as witches and wizards and what have you. And I commissioned Merlin to do me a staff, much like uh, the one used by the character Roshin in the end of magic, and it was just wonderful. And as a surprise last night for the holly king they turned up they'd made me a staff out of wood from a holly tree i'll just i said wait there listeners oh. i mean we, we, it's funny because we we hanging above there we go hanging above my terry pratchett's <laughs> so. oh wow look at that that's a properly yeah, they, uh, let me get my headphones back on so yeah it's a and it's made from holly oak and there are symbols here Ooh, uh, to do with the moon that's the wow. word woodville there and they've got um, runes, so FB for Fay Bright, and it's just wonderful. And you can't beat having a big lump of wood in your hand, honestly. It's very handy. And what's the, what's the, your... what's the bit of wood that knocks against it? Is that some particular kind of tradition to have on staffs, that little dongly thing? I, I, I have no idea. Maybe there's some, <laughs> maybe there's some sh- magic in that. Because I'll, in Canada, sure you'd use that to scare the bears off because you need to make a noise when you, yeah, when you walk well, that's through That's probably the what it is. That's probably yeah. what I know. I know they've got a, a bit bell. of land in the middle of nowhere in Wales, and uh, there's all sorts of oh, strange wild creatures out there. So, well, I'm yeah. wondering if it's mystic. I wonder if there's some kind of whether do they do a ceremony with it at all and they put any kind of I wouldn't be magic surprised. Into it. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh. There's all sorts of runes, protective runes, and things on here as well. So <laughs> it's just magical. So if you, magical. if you start growing a massive long beard mark over the next few months and. Uh, and start wearing capes and, and pointy hats. I know something's afoot. Yeah, I mean, I I need to grow a beard in the first place, which I can't do. I, I never get beyond like a week. Well, maybe the, the room, just, maybe yeah. the room will give you facial hair powers. You never know. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Um, but yeah, it was great. I got to say thanks to everyone who came along. It was it was a really really wonderful evening. Um, big thank you to Merlin and Raven, all the staff at Waterstones Canterbury. Martin Latham says hello, and oh. of course everyone who came. Lots of listeners. Fiona from the Academy came. Oh, uh, it was fantastic. just lovely to see everyone. It was it was just terrific. Really. Really, really good so um had a very good time oh wonderful stuff and it's we we always talk about milestones in the academy and it, you can never take for granted these may and major moments i mean mm-hmm. you're on your you know series of books we can talk a bit, bit about series with our guest today but um series of books um you know it's always about the focus of getting the next one out the next one out but it's really important to have those moments isn't it where you just stop and take a breather and go i did it I've got it out there and everyone can come and celebrate. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So I hope people who are in that place in their writing right now, where they're kind of partway through their book, they're thinking, will I ever get this done? Oh, I'm not, not got the flow anymore. Oh, this is low rub. Keep pushing through, keep pushing through because all these good things await you on the other side of of the end, as it were. Speaking of getting things done, how's the nonfiction? Oh, nonfiction's, nonfiction's going great. Nonfiction is going great. We're, we're busy preparing for our nonfiction program in the academy. And uh, it makes me realize actually with nonfiction, there's a whole load of other things we have to consider as authors. Um, there's a bit more of the brand building, I think, in nonfiction. Like, I mean, obviously fiction, you've got to build your brand, but, you know, a nonfiction authors are often maybe writing a book to enhance something that they're already doing in their career, for example, mm. or, yeah, yeah. you know, it might be kind of linked directly with something that they, you know, writing that book can give them a real platform to, to, to get 
to get conference gigs and to do speeches, yeah. to run courses and retreats and all things like that. So, so yeah, I'm kind of contemplating and I'm interested actually feedback from people out there, you know, what, what kind of things do nonfiction writers look for today in terms of um, things, you know, and one of the things I thought, Mark, and I'm, I'm planning a course on this for the nonfiction stream is how to do a podcast and how to present yourself on a podcast, how to become a guest. Because I suddenly thought, we've got a bit of experience in this. <laughs> we've been doing it six years. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing about, we get approached by a lot of nonfiction authors for the bestseller experiment, don't we? So, um, you know, I think that would be some, and it has come up um, in the Academy quite a lot. You know, obviously fiction authors need, need to really look at podcasts as an option. But for a lot of people, it's really quite a scary thought. It's a bit like public mm. speaking in a way, isn't it? Like, and yeah. I think we take it for granted. We show up each week. We've done this for a number of years, but uh, we still get some very nervous authors coming on who, you know, are big bestsellers, but, you know, it isn't, doesn't feel natural for them just to come and chat on a podcast. And mm. so, yeah, all kinds of interesting things. So if anyone's interested in, um, if, if people are interested in looking into the nonfiction course, pop along to academy.bestseller.com experiment.com and you can put, pop yourself on the vip list to find out more about that now listeners if uh, for those of you who get to the very very end it's worth it this week because we're going to be reading an extract from sc gowland's new novel delusions and dragons which features a cameo from two marks uh, and i'm going to be reading from this my lawyers are going to be listening in um, so do stay right to the very that's going to be our book at bedtime bit right at the end of the podcast so hang around for that also just to say this Saturday 7th of October I'm going to be at the Maystone Literary Festival I'm doing a talk called What Next so basically if you've written a novel what next? What do you do? Okay, do you need an agent? Do you need a publisher? Do you self-publish? I'm going to be going through all of those options. Uh, so that's going to be at Maystone Literary Fest, Kent History and Library Centre in Maystone, Kent, 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, and following me will be Kelly Weeks, who did a deep dive a few weeks ago uh, on marketing your book as well. And Maystone Lit Fest are doing a special double bill price for that so you can get two tickets uh, well cheaper tickets for both events and i'll put a link in the show notes uh, so you can check that out but do come along it's gonna be lots of fun sounds absolutely fantastic and on that delusions and dragons and and apparently some <laughs> kind i have no knowledge of any of this this is all going to be new for me but it does remind me of i think is this our second possibly third cameo i remember one where we second. had in, i think it's second yeah. there was a romance book wasn't there do you remember that <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there, right? so oh this is going to be fun so you've got to stick around for that folks well mark let's i can't wait let's dive straight in so tell us about our, our special guest this week gareth l powell Yes, Gareth L. Powell is known for using fast-paced, character-driven science fiction to explore big ideas and themes. He's twice won the coveted British Science Fiction Association Award for Best Novel, and he's become one of the most shortlisted authors in the awards history. He's also one of those authors who are really generous with their time, experience, and wisdom on social media. Now, he has been on the podcast before, but that was way, way back in 2018. Remember those days, Mr. D, 2018. Oh, uh, yes. He'd just uh, published The Embers of War, the first of an epic space adventure series since then a lot has happened not least he's got a new book called descendant machine uh, we discuss what happens when novels vanish from your computer writing with your heroes in imposter syndrome and staying positive on social media fantastic well let's dive in and listen with mark as he chats with gareth l powell gareth l powell welcome back to the bestseller experiment how are you today sir I'm good, thank you. Very good indeed. Um, a lot has happened since you were last on. You were last on the podcast, I think in 2018. You just published Embers of War, which was the first of an epic space adventure series. And a lot has happened since then. I'd like to talk about all that. But let, first, let's focus on your new book, Descendant Machine, which is second in the Continuance series. And as I understand it, these are an interlinked duology. This is like 50 years after the Stars and Bones, the first one. There are different characters, but they're both linked. Tell, tell us about Descendant Machine. Well, um, I've just come off the back of writing a trilogy, um, the Embers of War trilogy. And I was uh, pitching a new novel to Titan. And I kind of wasn't really in the mood to get stuck into a series. Um, and they were um, and they were like the same. They were like, well, we kind of want we want a series, we, we want a series that people can just pick up 
a book and read it without having to pick it up and say, oh, I've got to read the first two. So um, I think in publishing, they call it onboarding. So they could onboard the reader at any point in the series. So we came up with this idea of a series um, set in the same universe, but telling different stories. And um, so that each one's a standalone. Um, So I created this backdrop, which I thought was ripe for telling lots of stories, which is the human race having been thrown off the earth um, and uh, set adrift in some some arcs um, floating through the sky. And there's scout ships going ahead of the fleet to get into trouble and and explore. And then there's all the politics and the um, adventure inherent in a thousand arcs full of human beings in space. Um, And then I just told two stories set against that backdrop and uh descendant machine uh is very different in tone stars and bones was excuse me uh much more of a sci-fi horror um kind of owing more to john carpenter's the thing um whereas descendant machine is much more of a uh sort of mystery sort of spy thriller almost with this there's this big machine and nobody quite knows what's um, what it does, but some people want to start it, some people want to stop it, and it's a big race to do that and find out what the machine contains. Terrific stuff. That, that's, I mean, to write a trilogy is an epic challenge in itself, but it does at least have a beginning, middle, and end, and people are used to trilogies. To be, but having this kind of onboarding idea where you have essentially a new story each time that continues a kind of continuity, but also, people can drop in and out. That's that's easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, what were the what were the particular challenges for you in in putting putting this these two together? And will there be more? That's the other question. Well, I mean, I mean, the main chapter uh, challenge when writing the second book was not to let characters from the first book creep into it. Right. Um, the first draft I did, I kind of brought back a load of characters and thought, hang on a minute, I'm just writing a straight sequel. So, um, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, that first uh, 30,000 words of the novel disappeared off my hard drive. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I used, I mean, it was, it just went off every device. All my devices are linked. It went. Um, I, I used specialist recovery software, everything, and not a sign of it. It had just completely vanished. And I'm to this day, I have no idea how that was possible. But maybe future me came back and erased it. <laughs> <laughs> because it, I started again and I started afresh and the without the sort of hangover from the first book and, and the second book therefore is a lot stronger because of that. That I you know, I've I've a memory of this cropping up on social media as well. I think I think I remember this happening to you and, and I was again I was, you know, my heart was bleeding for and of course, you know, people weighed in and go, Well, why didn't you back it up? Now it's clear that you did have it backed up, but something just just one of those things happened. But was there as well as the turmoil of thinking, Oh my god, all that time and work wasted, was there a kind of relief? Was there a kind of okay, fresh fresh sheet of paper? was was it was it a gift in a way? Uh in the long run, it was a gift. Yeah. At the time, I just lay on the sofa and thought, I'm never going to write again. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's over. I can't possibly start, you know, I can't possibly start, you know, it's, it's like getting a boulder halfway up a hill and it rolls back down and you think, oh, I do not have the strength to do that again. Um, but I did. And Obviously, it was wildly different than the first draft. Um, so it, it turned out to be a much, much better, um, a much more fortunate turn of events than it appeared at first. But uh, can, can I ask, where did you find the strength? Because there will be people listening to this where this has happened to them, and they will be thinking, this is it, I can't, I give up, I walk away. Uh, what, what, what made you get back on the horse, so to speak? Well, I, I mean, I have um, some uh, ADD characteristics means i find editing excruciatingly difficult to go back through stuff i've already done so the idea of rewriting the same story i just spent three months writing was just so abhorrent and so kind of that you know i just felt like my brain just noped out of the whole thing and it was like there's no possible way i can do this but a i had a contract and a deadline and if i didn't write it i'd have to give all the money back and secondly um my wife diane was just absolutely 
behind me in my corner believed in me told me I could do it and you know she she picked me up and dusted me off and and with her kind of support and belief I just I, I started to believe I could do it and I, and I did so yeah fantastic brilliant now when we last spoke to you you had just published Embers of War which was the first part of uh, the um, the Embers of War trilogy which was a massive epic space opera I mean this is I know you're a fan of Ian Banks and 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 you know we love those those galaxy universe spanning stories but that is I mean it's huge isn't it were there any I mean you'd already had a, a cracking trilogy with the Akak Makak uh, series. Uh, but this was much bigger in scope, wasn't it? What were the, was it, you know, we talk about, you talk about pushing that boulder up a hill, being at the foot of a mountain kind of thing. Well, how big a challenge was it for you? Um, it's going to sound awful, but it actually was really easy. Um, <laughs> I love, no, I love that answer. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd come off the, the back of the Akak Makak trilogy and I had this creeping horror that I was going to be hit by a bus and all I'd ever be remembered for was as a guy who wrote a book about a monkey. <laughs> so I set out to write this really serious literary um, exploration of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in fiction um, about a, a character who wakes up on a, a from a, a hibernation pod on a starship and everyone else is still asleep and he doesn't he's got amnesia so he doesn't know where he is he doesn't know how fast he's going or where he's going and the com ship's computer has had its memory wiped and so they have to go back through this guy's kind of personal possessions looking at what he's chosen to bring with him from earth to try and reconstruct his life and figure out who they are and where they're going um i think i've been reading too much david mitchell that summer um <laughs> And, you know, it was very literary and, and very, it came to about 90,000 words and really didn't gel together at all. Um, and my agent at the time sent it out to a few publishers who came back and said, this really doesn't gel together at all. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so um, I just got fed up with that and just thought, right, I'm just going to have some fun. And I sat down and I cranked out the first book of Embers of War in in about, five or six months and it just flowed out just poof, because it was just I wanted to get back to spaceships I wanted to get back to sci-fi I'd been banging my head against the keyboard doing this very literary book that really was not my wheelhouse um and I've always, as you say I've always loved like sci-fi Ian Banks Samuel Delaney's Nova is a favorite of mine I think that was a big influence on it as well I just wanted to put in all the stuff I liked, like talk, Saki talking spaceships, huge alien stuff, um, you know, massive conflict, um, and some great characters. And I just sat down and just went, Boomf, and it all came out. Um, and I wrote it kind of sort of as a standalone, but with sequel potential. Um, and then, because I always knew it was going to be a trilogy, but whether I, we could sell it as a trilogy would be another matter. But then Titan Books did pick up all three books as a trilogy. So then I went off and I wrote the second two. So, um, but yeah, that first one, it was just kind of a huge relief to be writing it and it was fun. And when you're having fun, it, it kind of, you probably know it just flows. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that it was the easiest book I've written from that point of view. Brilliant! Oh, so good to hear. Is there any trace of that literary book in the Embers of War books? Is did any did anything port over from that, or is that put away for another day, or is it trunked, or is it? Um, there was. I saved one storyline from it and published it. Uh, Self published it as a novella called uh, Downdraft, which right. is available on Amazon. Um, but it's just I stripped out one of the storylines from this book. They just didn't gel together. Um, and publish that, but um, yeah, the rest of it is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Important lesson to learn. Now, Embers of War, well, I mean, it's clear you were having huge fun with it, and it's paid off in space because it's being developed into a TV series. Uh, you've got Gary Grime adapting, Breck Eisner, who had directed episodes of The Expanse. Now, I'm guessing it's all on hold because of the strikes and what have you, but before the strikes came along, things were really trucking, weren't they? I'm sure you can't tell us much about it, but can you tell us about your experience of how this came about and, and how thrilling it must be? Yeah, well, I mean, 
initially we got the studio off, offered to buy the option on the book. Uh, I, th- I can't remember if it was before the second one or before the third one, but before the trilogy was fully published, wow. which I thought was a huge gamble on their part because I could have gone way off the rails <laughs> at the end. But they, um, they optioned, I think this was back in 2018. Um, so this has been cooking for a long time. Um, but very, very quickly, they got Gary Graham on board to write the script. Um, and I, I, I had some discussions with him and it, and then they, they, they went through a number of directors, um, gauging interest. There was, was some interest, but then they got, uh, Breck on board and he, um, he sat down and coming, um, in the wake of, as you say, doing the expanse, he knows his space opera onions. Mm. He knows what you can do on a screen and what you can't do on a screen. So he sat down with Gary and they rewrote the script. Um, the first chapter is set on a spaceship that's floating in the ocean because it's crashed. And he was uh, like, we cannot afford to build a water tank that big <laughs> just for one scene. So he rewrote that scene and he, it was uh, reading the script. It was kind of a masterclass for me in showing, not telling because mm-hmm. things I could explain to a reader in two or three sentences, he had to create an entire scene to sort of show that to the audience on the TV. Um, which was really interesting. And um people often ask that, oh, how do you get con- how do you keep control of your story and stuff if somebody else is writing the script? You don't. But they've made changes to the story, they've made changes to the book, but the characters are very faithful to the characters in the book. Mm. And the medium is such a different medium than a novel that obviously they have to rewrite and change things in order for it to work on screen. Um, but they've kept the spirit of the book and they've kept the, the, the sort of, uh, I, I'm very proud to keep my name associated with it, put it that way. Um, I've seen, they've done a, a mocked up trailer for right. to use in their pitches um, and it's just incredible. I've just watched it about 10,000 times. <laughs> um, you know, with your prickles on the back of my neck going, God, did I write this? And, um, yeah, and, and they were all ready just to start knocking on doors and saying, you know, let us pitch this to the networks. And then the strike happened and it was, uh, it was just, oh, so we shall see what state tv streaming is when the strike is over if it's ever over and Mm -hmm. we shall see what happens but um the studio's on board the director's on board the script writer's on board it stands as good a chance as it possibly can so yeah i think you're in a very good position actually because you are kind of coiled and ready to go and they are going to be desperate for material so um i yeah fingers crossed fingers crossed that sounds fantastic and another thing that you you must have been over the moon about is you co-wrote a novella light chaser with peter f hamilton legend in science fiction how did that come about and, and what was your working method with him uh well peter and i um sort of we, we've been on panels together at various events. Um, we, uh, I think, uh, the BSFA invited me to come along and, and interview him in front of an audience as well for one of their events, which I did. And then they invited about a year later, they invited me to be interviewed and said, Who do you want? And I said, Well, what about Peter? So he came and returned the favor. And it was, you know, we, we got on well and had fun. And we went to a few events. And at some point, one of us, I think it might have been me said let's write a book together and um not expecting it to happen and but it did and um so it we kind of uh i had an idea for a character but no story to go with it and peter had some uh sort of metaphysical ideas um but uh, but no characters and so we kind of hit some ideas around and, and there was a very kind of um sort of free floating kind of email discussion that went back and forth for a couple of months um, until a story started emerging. And uh, then uh, I went around to his, uh, his um, stu- uh, not studio study. And we, we sat there, which, um, you know, with all his books on the walls and it was like <laughs> I had a, a massive imposter syndrome moment that, <laughs> 
you know, because I, I, I was reading like the reality dysfunction before I started writing seriously. Yeah. And you know, yeah. I was a fan. And so to suddenly be, uh, 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 holy shit, I'm sitting in Peter <laughs> F. Hamilton's study and he's talking to me like I know what I'm doing. And <laughs> that was just, uh, that, that was a freaky moment. But we we divided the the story like, oh, we need a scene here. We need a scene there. So why don't you do these scenes and I'll do these scenes and... and um, a lot of the story takes place with this one character alone in her spaceship. So I had quite a good handle on who that character was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kind of did all the character chapters. Peter, obviously a consummate world builder. Um, so he did all the episodes where that take place on these different planets. And he came up with you know, these fantastic societies, just huge amount of stuff all crammed into a small chapter. Um, in fact, you know, trying to rein him in because, you know, you've seen how thick his books are. Yeah, yeah. And we, we're writing, you know, I was thinking this uh, this novella we're writing is going to turn out to be a 600-page epic. But, yeah. But somehow I think our styles meshed quite well together because mm. uh, uh, my, my brevity and his, his detail just kind of, brought the best out in each other, I think. Brilliant. And were there any sort of masterclass lessons that you took from working with Peter that you've carried on into your own work? There was a, um, there was a moment he wrote the first chapter um, and sent it to me. And what, the way we did it was we would alternate. We would use the same document and alternate back and yeah, forth yeah, yeah. Um, just to keep continuity and, and tone. Uh, so he sent me this first chapter, and the first thing I thought was, wow, I get to read a Peter F. Hamilton story before anybody else. And the second thing, I was reading it, and it's this spaceship the size of a giant skyscraper plunging into the heart of a star at relativistic velocities. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have to up my game. (laughs) (laughs) And that was just a reminder that you can do anything in sci-fi. You can just be as big and as bold and as brash as you want to be. Um, And, yeah, that, that was a pretty inspiring moment. Excellent. That sounds quite liberating, actually. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. And would you do it again? Is this something you you'd do again, maybe with Peter or with other authors? Or I think so. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I don't know if my agent would want me to do it again because there had to be a lot of uh, behind the scenes discussion between my agent and his agent, and yeah. coming to an agreement with them, and then them coming to an agreement with the publisher. And it, it was so. From that point of view, it was quite convoluted. But from the point of view of just two guys sitting down having fun. Yeah, it was brilliant. And um, yeah, I, you know, if I found another author that wanted to collaborate on something and it was somebody I admired, then then yeah, I'd certainly give it a try. Fantastic. Let's talk. I'd love to talk a bit about Ragged Alice, which I think I heard you read at EasterCon a few years ago, uh, which is a police procedure with a little dash of the supernatural and something very, very different from what you, you normally write. Tell us about that and how that came about. Uh, well, um, we were, uh, I was two books into the Embers of War series and I realized I had over a year to write the third one. So I thought, well, I could just take a little break and write something else. And my agent was kind of of the opinion that that something else should maybe be a kind of Lee Child style airport thriller that would make us insanely rich. <laughs> <laughs> so I went away and thought and wrote and wrote and thought. And I came back with this thing that was more like Twin Peaks set in West Wales. Right. So, um, you know, definitely not on brief, but it's a small fictional town near Aberystwyth coastal resort in West Wales. Um, my father was from Wales, from South Wales. Um, so I have a lot of memories of South Wales as a child. Um, cause we used to go there to visit my, my paternal grandmother all the time. Um, and the rhythms of the speech, the way people talk, the kind of fatalism, the um, the death is always is very present. You've got the the, the black chapels and the graveyards, and yeah. and also the countryside is incredibly beautiful. But at night, it becomes extremely eerie. Um, you, you know, you have the, the the pines along the ridge lines and the, the the valleys which are dark, and and the strange noises in the bracken. And it, it, so, I wanted to kind of capture all of that. Um, and that kind of my relationship with Wales and 
from that point of view, it's a very personal book. Um, the the crime stuff. I, I I did a lot of research about how the police deal with murders and and uh, you know the, the, how they structure investigations and stuff. So I tried to get that bit right. But also, there's some uh, some local characters and there's some ghosts and there's some uh, something weird going on at the the American air base at the top of the hill and and all this stuff and um, yeah, it was a very change of pace as you say from going from a space opera to writing this kind of rural horror and then back to space opera again but it was it was very much like a sorbet that cleared my palate to finish the trilogy yeah, um, yeah. but it, it's i think it, it it confused readers because it didn't it came out from tor.com um who do a lot of sort of sci-fi and fantasy uh novellas and this was not really either so uh, I'm not sure it ever really found its uh, it, its right audience. But that that Lee Child thriller that you originally briefed is, would that ever happen? Is that something you might ever come back to, or is it just not your bag? Probably not, because every time I think up an idea for a thriller, I just think, well, why won't they just call the police? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the whole thing falls apart. So it's um, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. And then uh, I like to talk about, and this is going to be of huge interest to all our listeners, uh, whatever genre they're writing in, you did a book called About Writing, which, as I understand it, started as a series of blog posts, then evolved into a a book via Luna Press, and then it was expanded for a a glance edition, which I think was twice as long. There it is. Tell us about how how this evolved. Well, pretty much as as you say, I was... um doing some uh, maintenance on my website and I thought I've got a you know many many years of blog posts on here I should probably back them up so um, using an extremely high-tech method I cut and pasted them into a word document Um, and the word document came out at about 60,000 words right Um, and I think I tweeted oh my god I think I've just accidentally written a book (laughs) Um, and Francesco from Luna Press sent me a message and said well he'll publish it so i i had I, I had no intention of writing a book about writing because obviously imposter syndrome mm-hmm. you know who who am i to you know who am i to like tell people this stuff i mean the my blog posts had been as i was on my journey to becoming a writer just writing down stuff i'd learned and sharing it with people coming at, you know a few steps behind me um i never s- sort of sat down and thought well I'm at Stephen King's level now. I think I'll knock out a book about how to that that wasn't so it was completely accidental. But Luna Press put out this very slim, kind of pocket-sized edition. We called it a field guide for aspiring writers. Mm. Um and it, it it did pretty well. It was quite popular. But um Gillian Redfern from Galantz really liked it. And I think she gave it to a few authors she'd signed to say, look, right. <laughs> some, you know, this is quite useful. Um, and then uh, she approached my agent and said, would Gareth be interested in doing a, a revised edition expanded? And I said, oh, of course. And um, and so Glantz bought out the contract from Luna um, and I signed a new contract with them and we spent uh, some time adding an extra, I think there's an extra 25,000 words in there. Um, lots of new topics um she had some ideas of things i hadn't covered that maybe i should cover um and yeah and, and we got it together and uh they even invited me down to london to read the audiobook oh brilliant because she, she felt it was such a, a personal book because it's me talking to people mm. that it should probably be in my voice so I, I went and sat down in london for two days and just read the book out in a very small hot booth <laughs> But yeah, I'm very pleased with how it's come out. Um, reading back through it for the audiobook, I noticed several mistakes and contradictions, but that's the nature of blog posts because you're learning over time and your, yeah. your yeah, opinions yeah. change and you learn more things. Um, and I think one of the messages of the book is there is no right one way to do anything. Yeah. So it's more yeah. a book about encouraging um, and suggesting rather than telling. So. Mm. 
Fantastic. Well, I can tell you, after 460 odd episodes of this podcast, I've contradicted myself many, many, many times. So I, I totally understand that. I'd like to talk about that that thing of being an author in in the 21st century, particularly on on social media, because you're you're terrific on social media. You've been very, very generous with your time. Sadly, Twitter or X, as we're supposed to call it now, has has gone turned into this kind of hell zone. But you're you're still out there offering advice, and uh, I mean, how. How did this? I mean, you talk about that imposter syndrome thing, which I think we all feel to a degree, uh, and social media as well can be very anxiety-inducing in a lot of authors who tend to be quite private people. But how have you? What's your sort of strategy been with with social media to sort of reach out to people? Well, I mean, it, it, uh, we, we have to go right back to like twenty sixteen, where there was um, various elections and referendums and. Mm life on on online was becoming increasingly polarized and it seemed to be people were attacking each other and, and more and more and it was more and i just got fed up with it and i yeah. just thought you know i needed to inject some positivity into the world so i just typed can i help anybody with anything into twitter and people started asking me questions and all saying can you just give me a virtual hug or can you tell me to get back to work and you know, it kind of snowballed from there, and I just started doing that regularly, just helping people out, doing Q and A's, um, just as a way to kind of give back and encourage and, and put some positivity into the world. Um, and that, I think, you know, and that attracted a, a lot of goodwill in return. I think um, I'm very much a believer that you, you kind of get back a lot of what you put out. Yeah. So if you put out negativity and you arguing constantly with people, you're going to get people coming back and getting all up in your face. Agree. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I just I just carried on doing that and just trying to help people um, be useful, uh, be kind, um, be encouraging. Um, and obviously Twitter is kind of circling the drain at the moment. Um, so I'm on Blue Sky. Um, I'm on Threads, even though it's really quiet over there at the moment. Um, but my main focus at the moment is on Substack, where mm. I've got a, a newsletter Um but it's more like it's kind of a cross between a newsletter and a blog. Yeah. So I do a monthly newsletter, um, which goes out to 2,000 odd free subscribers. Um, but then I also do paid content during the month for people who want sort of in depth articles about writing advice and, um, and, uh, sci fi and, and future tech and stuff. So there's sort of two levels of membership and it's really, rekindled my love of of blogging which had gone away for a long time mm. um and that helps with my longer form writing as well because it keeps me in the writing zone um mm. so yeah so i'm really enjoying that at the moment i'm building up quite a nice community there yes which is is slightly more robust than just uh um a, a social media platform because if some cranky billionaire comes along and buys Substack, I can export my mailing list to another mailing list provider. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not, I won't like lose all those followers because. Yeah. So I think the future of social media is going to be agility. We're going to have right. to get used to hopping from platform to platform and going where the audience is. Yeah. Um, I don't think there will ever be one dominant site like Twitter again. I think when it is, it's going to be fragmented and we're going to have to get used to that. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. If I post something now, I've got to post it five times. So it's <laughs> you know, hopping from platform to platform. Um, I saw uh, recently, I think it was announced in May, you've sold two new books to Titan. Uh, can you tell us anything about those? What's coming in the future there? Yeah, well, I've I've also handed them both into Titan now. So Wow, speedy. Yeah, there's another novel um, called Future's Edge which is a space opera. So if you liked um, the Ebbers of War series or the Stars and Bones Descendant Machine series, you'll like this one as well. It's more of the same, but different. Um, it's in a whole new universe again. Um, and it's kind of like Casablanca set in space. Nice. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of, it's not, you know, that's just a, a fairly glib way of putting it. But, um, yeah, so hopefully they'll enjoy. The other book is a short story collection because I've had uh, I've had two collections out over the past fifteen years. Um, the first one they was out from uh, Elastic Press in two thousand and eight, but they 
ceased trading a couple of years later, so it disappeared. There were only ever 300 copies printed. And the second one was from New Compress a few years ago, um, but again, fairly small circulation. So when talking to Titan and the opportunity to do, you know, a, a sort of a collection of all my best love stuff, a lot of those stories have not really been circulated very widely. So only a, you know, only a few people have ever read them. So the idea of putting them out from a, a publisher like Titan was, was sort of irresistible. So I wrote a few new stories. There's some stories in there set in the Embers universe and set in the Descendant Machine universe. Um, and, and some other new stuff. And then a lot of my old sort of best loved stories from from before so there's there's over a hundred thousand words of stories there um Fantastic. and that that book's going to be called who will you save right. um and that is coming out in uh september 2025 so two sort of two years today really wow okay fantastic i also saw now you mentioned Diane early, uh, J. Diane Dotson who uh that's her writing name she, her real name is Jendia Gammon uh you two are setting up a production company. I saw something about this. It all looks a bit, I, I appreciate you probably can't say too much about it at the moment, but this sounds very exciting. Can you give us any hints or is this still work in progress or? Uh, it's still very much a work in progress. It's a kind of, it's a long-term scheme that eventually we will have our own production company um, for kind of uh, screen works um, and, um, and so on, but there'll also be a publishing imprint, which I think is going to be the first thing that we're going to do. Wow. Um, so we, we've got the names of the company, we've got the names of the imprint, we've got logos, we've got, you know, it's it's all coming together slowly. Um, we're not ready to go live on it yet. Um, there's a lot of uh, ducks to be put in a row before we do, and we've both got other projects. So this is, mm. this is our long-term thing we're working on in the background, but... Um, at some point, there will be a huge splashy launch for, for the imprint. But um, at the moment, we're not accepting submissions or, or anything like that. It's still very early days. Yeah, so I was just going to say, listeners, do not deluge them with submissions yet. Yeah, wait. But that sounds really exciting. It's something I'm seeing a bit more and more, particularly among traditionally published authors, is you know it's all very well being published by a big, big publisher or what have you. But we like to have an element of control as well over our own destiny and future and stuff like that. So it's very exciting to see that. I have to ask as well, it's been wonderful seeing your romance blossom online. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to talk too much about that uh, as, as a personal thing, but would this mean that you two would be writing together as a project that you might work on together? Oh, we, we've had several ideas. We've got a, uh, uh, brilliant, couple of outlines for things and it's it's just when the time is right um we'll we'll do it um but uh yeah we've got a lot of stuff uh that we'd like to do together and also we we read each other's work as we're writing you know right um diane's a uh written three novels this year or something <laughs> and <laughs> she, she's amazing she can she her last two novels she did two novels in four months basically two months each just absolutely hammered through them and she would like send me a chapter every night and i'll read it and Brilliant. um and you know i'll send her you know if i've read a couple of if i've written something i'm, I'm pleased with i'll send it to her and she'll read it and it's, it's great because uh we kind of it's great to have that kind of uh sharing that you don't usually get as being a writer is a very solitary profession yeah um yeah, yeah, yeah. but having someone who's doing the same stuff and going through the same thing and be able to um kind of keep each other focused it is just fantastic brilliant that oh, sounds fantastic well look when when this thing happens we'd love to talk to you about it whenever it's ready in the meantime folks you've got descendant machine out there you've got stars and bones you've got embers of war you've got fantastic book about writing uh, and and all sorts of other stuff too so until then gareth it's been great speaking to you and hope to speak to you again soon thank you what are your writing dreams finishing that book quitting the day job becoming a best-selling author well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit 
bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. Did you ever see, Mark, that Apple TV series called Silo? No, it was recommended to me a lot. I've oh, not seen it. Yeah, I've heard very good things. Listening to, to Gareth's novel, and I, I'm big into space span- fantasies now. I, I watched Silo about a couple of months ago. Absolutely mm-hmm. brilliant. And it came from a book called Wool, which yeah, was yeah. Uh, Hugh Howey, I believe, who had that big independent, independent author, big breakthrough. But listening, listening to, to Gareth talking about all of his kind of space odysseys that he's been working on, Sounds like quite the universe that he's built there. It is. And I've got to say, we recorded this. So we're recording this on Wednesday, 27th. Uh, Today, it's been confirmed that the WGA strike is over. So we were talking Mm. about the writer's strike in there. It's now over. Uh, They're going back to work. Uh, And I'm sure that the actors, SAG, after a union, are no doubt going to follow suit in a few weeks. So things are going to get back on track. So fingers crossed that we will see Embers of War on telly sometime well these things take forever to be honest let's be honest but sometime <laughs> sometime in the next five years let's say that. Well, exactly <laughs> it's gonna say but he's been waiting since 2018 he said when exactly, it was like yeah, already, yeah. already five years has passed but yeah. great news on the strike finishing and mm. um it's going to be interesting to see what that period of time where there, there was nothing nothing being produced um, what what kind of knock on effect that does have for shows which have been sitting there waiting to go, and whether yeah. we're going to get a bit of a, a dearth of, of of material, or whether there'll be a, a gap possibly in a lot of the schedules, then we start moaning. Well, what happened your what, Netflix? What happened on in the last strike? Is it two thousand eight? Is that basically reality TV was boosted because they didn't use writers for that. So I guess a it's lot cheaper of, to produce you know, pre- Jersey pre- Shore and shows like oh, that. Oh yeah, just absolutely oh. took off during that. Period. So some so, people yeah. will be like, "Yes," and other people will be like, oh. "Seriously?" <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. reality TV is one of those marmite things, isn't it? It's kind of like you either you either binge it or you or you turn the TV off as soon as it starts. And I I say there's such a breadth of reality TV shows now as well. There's there's, there's something for everyone really. But mm-hmm. um, the latest one actually, without mm-hmm. digressing too much. Uh, Love Island for midlife. Have you heard about that? Of course I haven't. What makes you think I know anything about that? No, but this is <laughs> this is so funny. Apparently, it's, it's um, the thing that made me laugh is that the twist on it is it's it's kind of couples who've either been divorced or widowed, and they go into a kind of Love Island scenario to kind of try and meet a new partner in their forties or fifties. But the catch is, is that the teenage kids are watching everything oh from a remote God. location and you get to get all the cringy groaning and like, oh my God, I can't believe my my mum's doing that. And, I mean, it, it sounds, I can't admit, I'm kind of tempted to watch it. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask. I wasn't going to ask, well, watch it or sign up for it. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just doing my research, Mark. No, no. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Can you, that is just, it's quite a genius idea. It's quite a genius idea, but um, but we digress let's talk about i want to ask you mark about something that gareth talked about called onboarding now i'm very familiar with onboarding you know when you that's a whole term within the web web world where you have a new person start start their journey with a you know like with the academy for example it's an onboarding Mm. process but it means something different doesn't it when you're writing books yes it's very much in my mind at the moment actually because i'm writing book five of the witches of woodville and book six i've had conversations with my agent i've said book six will be an onboarding book. It, the, it's, it's, it's the book that new readers can get on board with without having read all the others. Now, I've worked very hard. You know, the first Crow Folk, Babes in the Wood, Ghost of Ivy Barn, Holly King, they all work kind of as standalone books. There's There are little things that you maybe need to know for the previous ones, but I, I bring you up to speed on, on those, and they can work as standalone books. Uh, book five that I'm working on now, no chance. I, I've just gone. Now nah, you're going to have to have read all of these to make any sense of this. So I'm it's that one. I'm going all in making that, and I'm sort of tying up loose ends in in book five. So a book six will be very much a new chapter uh, in these characters' lives. So book six, I'm thinking, yeah, this is an onboarding book, and it's one of these things where there will be a pivot 
in the story, in the way the stories are told, in in the adventures that we have. It's going to be slightly different. Not too different to alienate the readers who already love it, but different enough that you can say maybe there'll be different cover art, maybe there'll be different design style or, or what have you. Um, and you get this with long running series that you you have one where maybe a new character comes to you know the precinct or whatever maybe a new cop starts with the detective maybe and they can be the ones who go okay what's going on here what's his story what's that what's going on so you kind of gently ease the reader in um and you see that with very successful long-running series this kind of onboarding idea that you can just ease the new reader in there are some that do it brilliantly you know they uh um, you know, Bernard Cornwall's very good at it. Ian Rankin's very Michael Conley. They're all very good at sort of gently easing you into the story uh, mm. every every few books. So when you've got when you've got a longer series, is there a general rule, unwritten rule, which about how many of those books? So let's say you've got six books. I mean, should the should the, every other book be an onboarding book so that you kind of catch people along the way so that they might read say book four and then go back to read one, two, and three, and then jump to five. I don't that think not really how it works. I don't think there's a rule. I think it depends very much on, because if you're writing a trilogy, a trilogy is a trilogy. It's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's no onboarding there. There's no, there's no, you can't, you know, you can't start the Empire Strikes Back and expect to know what the hell's going on. It's just not mm. going to happen. Or, you know, the Two Towers and Lord of the Rings or whatever. It's just, there's just too much. You need to read them in order because they are one, uh, uh, they are of a piece. Um, but then with detective procedurals, you know, I remember, uh, I think it was Ian Rankin's fifth book, Black and Blue, which was the hit. And whenever we did promotions with authors like that, uh, you know, Kindle promotions or what have you, we'd say, well, what one are we going to promote? And it, it very often it'd be, let's, let's do black and blue. Cause it's a great, it's where he hit his stride. It's uh, it was the one that saw a quantum leap in sales and it's generally regarded as one of the, the best novels in the series. So it's like, yeah, book five, let's go with that one. So it's funny. So it, it, it just depends. You know, there mm. are some authors who might take, might be the second or third book. That's the best one, you know, that so with Terry Pratchett, uh, I do a whole video. I'll put a link in the show notes as well. I do a whole video on YouTube about where to start with Cher Terry Pratchett. And there are actually <clears throat> a good seven or eight different kind of onboarding points with Terry, depending on your taste and what kind of books that you like. So mm -hmm. uh, it is very much horses for courses, but you will, it's, it's an interesting thing to study because it's often where the writer hits their stride, where everything kind of clicks together. And where, if you were a fan of the series, it's the book that you would recommend as well, which as a writer is often quite difficult to gauge. But there are, I mean, it's funny with The Holly King, people are saying, I've had I've had really good reviews where people are going, oh, this is the one. Uh, it's got darker. Yeah, I've seen that. And, like, yeah, best one yet. Yeah, yeah I've, best I've read one a lot yet. of those comments, yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, if, do you take them with a pinch of salt or, or what? But I, I you know, I... Um, I do, do seem to have had a lot more of them this time around. Yeah, so well, that's great. That's, yeah. that's that's, yeah, that's yeah. going to be interesting to kind of track that and and see if you see if you get a lot. And also the knock on effect of when you get you know in the in the the latest book um, getting highly recommended, whether you get you see that follow through of everyone then jumping back to one. And that's the nice thing because that classic thing of people reading and like binging a book and then that moment where the author gets when you when you having the next one out, but when you've now got three, four, five, six books previous, mm. then there's something for them to get their teeth into whilst they're Absolutely, waiting for the next yeah. one, which is, that's yeah, yeah. the benefit of having gone through that, you know, the long haul of writing the series. So fascinating yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. We'll watch this space. Now, another thing that I found incredibly inspiring that Gareth talked about is this idea of um, positivity on social media, because there is, there is a lot of, and there has been obviously a lot of, um, kind of punching down, I guess you'd say, with, with social media. And, and there's been a lot of bad stuff around social media for quite a few years. There's a whole privacy thing. There's, you know, obviously what's happened with Twitter and what's the transition it's going through, the launching of X, the, you know, blue sky, the hidden behind, you know, in, invites to get to certain social media. Yes. And it, it does, we do, I feel like we're in this time where social media is 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 growing up actually i think we're, it's an adolescence now and it's kind of mm. going through those teenage growing pains but i loved gareth's take where he said yeah things things have changed 
But rather than just ditching it and leaving it, he wanted to be this positive force. And just, mm. I love the fact that he just asked that question, you know, how can I help? And it reminded me that it really, in life, you know, we get what we put in, you know, we, we, how we choose to show up is what we experience in the yes, world. And, absolutely. and what's happened with Gareth is that he's now, you know, he's, he's looked at other things. Uh, he's built mailing lists. He's, he's aware of the fact that, you know, it feels like a lot of social media sites do have a, a certain lifespan and, and this idea of having to move around. But wasn't that encouraging to hear somebody who's like embracing the change, be the change that, you know, you want to see on social see, media, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. to very badly paraphrase Gandhi. But, um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's true though, isn't it? Because social media is really just a platform where people communicate. You know, yes. it's, it's no yes. different from your local park or your local community center or your local church. So wherever people gather, you're going to get good vibes or you're going to get, you know, a lot of bad muck being Yeah, around. but I mean, the difference to social media is you can be anonymous or you can throw rocks exactly. away or whatever. Yeah. Uh, which, and, but it's interesting that he said that, and of course he's a science fiction author, so he's constantly peering into the future. And he said the future of social media is agility. It's going to be fragmented. We are going to be hopping around from one place to another. But I think it, that, that just reminds me more than ever, it's so important to have your little corner of the internet that you call your own, albeit a blog or a Substack. Or I mean, he said sub, Substack. You know, I've seen a lot of authors jumping to Substack. Uh, but as he said, that could be mm -hmm. taken over by, you know, another megalomaniac. But um, yeah. So, yeah, have a little bit of the internet that is yours that uh, where if someone does get Larry, you can just kick them off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you had a delve into Substack? yourself I, have you kind of I've, looked at it? I've I've looked at it and I've just thought well actually what's interesting is a lot of authors who don't who used you, you see kind of a life cycle here you had authors who used to blog and then moved to social media and did really really well on social media and of course Twitter was micro blogging let's not forget that that's where it kind of came from and they were kind of oh the blog is dead the blog is dead but then Twitter became this monster monstrous thing and they don't necessarily want to go back to blogging, so they're going to Substack, where there's a kind of a paid element to it as well. So it's a cross between a newsletter and a blog. So I've I've always sort of hung on to my newsletter and blog anyway, so I don't feel the need to switch to Substack. It just feels like a, a another thing to me. So I'm not. I, I've seen authors do very well on it. It's not for me. I've got mm. my own stuff. Uh, yeah. I don't see the need to 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 shift over to, to it do yet. another thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 really interesting. I'm actually reading a fascinating biography, uh, biography Walter Isaacson's new kind of Elon Musk biography. And interesting when you go back to PayPal when he he kind of combined with PayPal, his company was called X, and this is where the yes. whole X things come yeah, from. That's where yeah. he had the X.com domain. Um, but he says in um, he said in the biography like years ago that he always envisaged PayPal becoming this all, you know, like a, 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 like a monetary and social site, which all comes together into one. So mm -hmm. the, the heavy rumors right now is Twitter is going to expand to become a payment app. And because he got booted out of PayPal, interestingly enough, it was it's really interesting, like reading the backstory. But yeah, the whole and there's even rumors last week that Twitter was going to go behind a paywall at some point, yeah, I've which would be a pretty ma major step. But yeah, the, the, the point is, is that as creators, you know, if we put all of our heart and soul into one of these external platforms that we don't own, we are it's a bit like you know, it's a bit like being in a rental house, which we once experienced actually, you know, being in a rental house and the landlord saying, oh, uh, no longer want to rent the property. Actually, I want to move back in. Can you, can you all, you know, disappear off? And and we had to leave the house and it was, you know, three kids were in it's in just, Canada. Nightmare. It's just, just happened to a friend of mine, actually. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And I mean, there's probably a lot of people who said, yeah, it's happened Nightmare. to me or it's happening to me. Mm -hmm. And I must admit when it, when that happens, I made myself a promise and I, I said to myself, I never ever want to be in that situation again where I find me and the kids and my wife were kind of like, like we, were, we weren't homeless, but we were close to not having a place to live until someone actually stepped in and saved our bacon for a few months. And this is all whilst Jen was going through cancer as well. Just to put it into perspective, it was like crazy thing. But, you know, obviously the landlady was struggling. She she probably wouldn't have done that if she wasn't struggling. But, uh, but it... it I, 
it always makes me then think about social media and we're kind of a weird connection, but it's like never build on rented land, you know, never build on rented land because you've got to own your career. You've got to own your core fan base. Amazon are not going to give you those email addresses. Twitter aren't going to give them to you. So you've got to get people on your mailing list. It's, it's the number one rule still. And uh good reminder from Gareth. Now folks, um, Mark's doing this amazing reading that's going to be coming up, which you do not want to miss. So um, we're going to be doing the rest of the, the uh, discussions around Gareth in the extended today. And we're going to talk about the importance of backing up. And folks, if this hasn't happened to you, maybe this is your saving grace hearing us today, because I've got a tip for you that you must, must follow if you don't want to lose your work. So listen to that in the extended. Plus, we're going to have a quick chat about how contract deadlines can help keep you going as much <laughs> as much as they're a nightmare. <laughs> we're going to dive into um, you know this idea of maybe writing a blog that one day might turn into a book. And Mark's going to deep dive on writing and understanding genre. So folks, if you would like to join us in this week's extended, just pop along now to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. Sign up to our $10 a month patron. That's all it is, 10 bucks a month. Not even a couple of Starbucks coffees. Everyone uses that analogy. And I, I don't know how much a Starbucks is, but apparently it's quite, quite cheap and expensive at the same time. So if you'd rather get <laughs> hours and hours of Mark and I, um, talking hundreds about of hours. Hundreds, hundreds of hours. Of yeah, hours. well, there are hundreds of hours of extra deep dives you get access to now, folks. Um, pop along to that website, uh, bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support and join us for the extended. So, Mark, what's happening this week on our wins and social media? Uh, we've got some lovely stuff here. So Rachel Chapman, long supporter of the podcast, long-standing member of the BXP team. And she says, I am so pumped right now. I just pump, popped in to say, I finished the edits on the porcelain hand. Can you believe it? To those of you who gave your time freely, and these are all members of the BXP team, and my beautiful beta reader, Laura Reagan, thank you. Just got to get Andrew Chapman uh, to give it a pass. And of course, Andrew's been on the podcast before as well. Uh, Mark, can you put a big green tick over my public declaration date at the end of the month? Tar, I'm off now to eat a whole Colin the Caterpillar cake. Now, I, know, I know Rachel's been working on this for a long time. Uh, you know, it's uh, she's, she's, you know, never given up. And this has been such an amazing achievement for us. So can't wait to read The Porcelain Hand. It's been a long time coming, but I absolutely know it's going to be worth it. So congratulations, Rachel. Congratulations, Rachel. Absolutely fantastic. Persistence at its finest. Absolutely. And a wonderful win uh, from Karen Story on the Academy. And she says, I hope I can call this a public reading win. And Karen says, a few weeks ago, my short memoir piece had been awarded runner up in the South Warwickshire Literary Festival. And I was asked if I would read it out publicly during the festival. In my former career as a sign language interpreter, I was used to getting up on stage in large, large auditoriums. Uh, however, reading a piece of my own writing from a stage was a brand new experience. I was a little nervous, but I agreed. On reflection, a memoir piece which brought back memories of a highly emotional time was probably a tough one to do a stage debut with. The piece told the story of an incredible incident two days after the planes crashed into the Twin Towers in New York. My brother worked as a cop in the precinct opposite the then World Trade Center. The piece I wrote was his story and our story of a touching coincidence that's too long to explain in a post here. So there I was today. I walked up onto stage, greeted the audience and started reading out this memoir piece. What I didn't expect was that during the most poignant moment in, in the story, I would have to stop then apologised to the audience because I was on the verge of tears. My brain was chastising me with, this is not supposed to happen. When I looked out at the audience, I was met with faces that were totally absorbed in what I was reading, and I knew I had to push through and read on. At the end of the reading, I received thunderous applause. After I left the stage, several people came up to me telling me that I had moved them to tears. Even hours later, different people found me and stopped me, telling me they thought it was a beautiful story and that they too had been sitting in their seats crying at the moment I'd become emotional. It certainly would not be my plan to read something on stage and then have to stop for a moment because I was emotional, but I guess it turned out okay because the story also seemed to have affected the emotions of the people listening. And when I think about it, that is one of my goals as a writer, to make people feel. So although I didn't want to have to almost cry on stage for it, I guess I can try and think of this one as a win. And this is brilliant, isn't it? This has sparked this oh. whole sort of you know thing in the academy about this. And and, we, and as a yeah. little post 
credit kind of thing to this. Um, there was someone in the audience from a publisher who's now interested in Karen's writing. So yeah, you know, I, I think mean, it could be a, a win-win-win. Um, it was such a powerful story and it's such a massive reminder about, and we forget when we're sitting in our little writing, our writing table, writing our book, you know, and it might be emotional, we forget the impact that our words can have on people and for Karen to experience that in a live audience it's a very it's a massive privilege in many ways yeah. because the authors don't get to see you know the person crying their eyes out having you know when they finish the end of the book or their, fa their favorite character gets killed off or whatever happens but it's just such an important reminder about the power of emotion and why it has to be front and center of everyone's writing because that's what moves people e motion motion yeah. moving people right absolutely so well done karen and i mean I'm, I'm i'm excited to think about how that experience will just really embed and help her writing in the future as well it's it's quite quite remarkable so well done for being brave enough to get through it karen i think yeah. that's the most important thing really absolutely fantastic absolutely. and then a nice little coda here now Susie edge she was on the podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about her new book vital organs which when you're listening to this, will be out now. Now we we all covet that little orange bestseller flag on um, Amazon, don't we? Did you know there's a purple one? Purple? Yeah, what? purple. Most gifted and vital organs is number one most gifted. Okay, wow. in medical instruments and supplies. <laughs> <laughs> medical but yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> but and she says i've never wow. seen a most gifted badge before i love it i suppose christmas is coming so yeah i mean it's like what, the purple you know. heart isn't it in some ways but that oh well it makes me wonder mark are there other colored flags that we it? don't know about most gifted most, most gifted. wished for maybe there's a most wished for yeah there's no well. idea of wish if you've had a yeah. have you had a different colored flag on amazon let us know we want to know about it maybe maybe this is a new thing but congratulations susie that's that's a great i mean most gifted that that's all about viral isn't it i mean that's what everyone wants right exactly Buy, usually gift something that you love yourself or you think someone will love yeah, you, and you don't stuff. want you don't want the brown one which is most badly reviewed <laughs> <laughs> The emoji, the, the poop emoji, <laughs> flag, or well, the poop emoji with a flag in it. <laughs> oh, brilliant stuff! Right. Excellent. Right. So, so folks, um, we're gonna um, we're gonna have this reading now, Mister Stay. <laughs> this is gonna be okay. So, I, I, again, I have no, I have nothing, I know nothing about this. I just read about this the other day. Friend of the podcast, S. C. Gowland, Steve Gowland. Um, he did warn me this was coming. And uh, he's written, you know, some amazing books. Uh, he normally writes epic fantasy, you know, so and, uh, you know, we love him. He's a regular. He's been supporting us for a very long time and a great author. And he sent me this and I hope you enjoy the book. Mr. D is in chapter four. You and he are in chapter five. Please don't sue me. Now, first of all, <laughs> how the hell do you get two chapters and only get one? What was wrong We're with that? We're going to find out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, oh. I'm not. I'm obviously not going to read from them all, uh, but I, I'm going to read from the second chapter, which is both it's, of us. It's the two of us. Although, Are we actually, will, is it is it us by name then, or uh, no spoilers? Okay, all okay, I will okay. all I will say is in your <laughs> chapter you're smoking a cigar. So oh, so, yeah. interesting. So yeah, I'm gonna. I'm. I've and he, he delusions and dragons. He pitches as romancing the stone meets Jumanji. And Tasha Stone oh. is on the verge of her dream promotion and a better life, but there's one thing holding her back, her husband, Gary, who thinks he's got it all. Um, so Gary is a bit useless, I think, as comes across in this extract <laughs> I'm going to read. Um, so G Gary's, for context, this is a store. It's a, 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 a mysterious store. Um, and Gary's in the store with Tasha, and he starts and he says, I'd like to return this, please. Got the wrong thing, he grinned sheepishly. What exactly would you like to return, sir? The shopkeeper's voice filled with doubt. This, said Gary, pulling a crumpled paper bag from his coat pocket. I bought it yesterday. Well, not from me, you didn't. Oh, no, not from you, another man. Gary's face frowned in concentration, eyes searching the ceiling for an answer. Um, Mark. I am Mark, said the shopkeeper. Another Mark, Gary ventured. Mark nodded in agreement. The other Mark... Smaller, dark curly hair, goatee beard. Gary measured the imaginary mark. <laughs> the present mark nodded. I know who he is. Excellent, said Gary, grinning widely. I'd like to return this. The bag rustled as he patted it lightly. 
Do you have a receipt? Gary blinked. A receipt, asked Mark, not even bothering to inspect the contents. Uh, Gary croaked. Without a receipt, we can't accept returns, I'm afraid, said Mark with an apologetic shrug. You could have bought this from anywhere. But I didn't, protested Gary, brow wrinkled. Without a receipt, I can't help. Mark pushed the bag back to Gary. It is a unique piece. That may well be true, intoned Mark, but we are not running some sort of best-selling experiment here. I need a receipt. Nicely shoehound, Steve. Mm, yeah. um, I wasn't given one. I highly doubt that. I wasn't, said Gary, a nasally tone to his voice now. Sorry. Tasha sighed and shook her head. This was just so typical. So typically Gary. I asked Mark, began Gary, catching the eye of Mark and winced. The other Mark uh, put something away for me just in case. Really? Mark's face brightened. Gary hummed and nodded in agreement. A, a, a pair of earrings? Ah! Mark wagged a knowing finger and smiled, then shuffled away into the back, leaving the pair alone. Exciting, murmured Gary with feigned excitement. Tasha hummed, eyeing a cobweb in one corner of the shop. An awkward silence followed, the ticking of a clock echoing the time. Hushed voices brought their attention back to the shop counter. Mark returned, ducking through a clicking bead string curtain and was followed by another man. The other Mark. The pair continued their discussion in hushed tones, ignoring both a confused-looking Gary and a foot-tapping Tasha. They chatted away, still ignoring their customers. Tasha cleared her throat. The pair's muted bickering continued. For goodness sake, muttered Tasha. Hi, she said, raising a hand. You went to check on something for him. She thumbed towards Gary. Ah, yes, said the other Mark. I remember you. He pointed and grinned. Nice to have a patron return. <laughs> Gary oh, grinned good. back uneasily. <laughs> I saw a pair of earrings, vintage earrings. Oh, yes, yeah, said the other Mark. I remember. It was weird you were looking for something really specific and we had it. Gary nodded, hopefully. Completely bonkers, added the other Mark. The original Mark nodded in agreement. Tasha waited. They all waited. It was then her nose twitched. Something she hadn't noticed before. A smell. The shop smelled of something she couldn't quite place. A sweet yet bitter aroma that stirred a memory deep in her mind. Glastonbury. <laughs> Weird, she thought, how it brought memories flooding back. I played there once, said the other Mark with a nod to her. <laughs> what? She bumbled, caught off guard. Glastonbury. Other Mark clicked his tongue, slowly nodding. Original Mark groaned, must you? He spread his hands wide. Other Mark shrugged and sucked his teeth. Good story about an incident with a cow, he added, if you're interested. He looked hopefully at Gary, then Tasha. Her hard look back at him made a hard look back made him lower his gaze. Another time, he muttered. The earring, said Tasha, struggling to control her annoyance. Oh, yeah, said the other Mark, clicking his fingers at her, finally on the same page. She looked at him expectantly, patience wearing thin. What about them? The other Mark said blankly. Where are they? Other Mark shrugged. May I see them? No, not sure that's possible. Because sold, she frowned. Sorry, he offered. Tasha looked at Gary. He stared blankly back. Are you kidding? She growled. Gary swallowed. Someone else bought them this morning, said the other Mark. I asked you to put them away from me, protested Gary. We sell things to people. Capitalism, you know, he shrugged, as if that explained everything. Gary groaned. She felt it coming and it was irresistible. The anger spread outwards from her chest, hot, furious and beautiful. It reached her fingers and made her head prickle. Can you do nothing right, she growled, turning her attention to Gary. Tash, he began, hands spread wide. It's Tasha, she screamed. T-A-S-H-A. Taking a step after each letter, Gary shrank back. You should know that. Would you like a moment alone? Asked original Mark with a raised hand. Mark, stay, said Tasha flatly. <laughs> okay, he went shrinking back. Both Marks fixed like statues. She fixed her aim back at Gary. You are so effing useless. Yeah. <laughs> she shook her head, jaw set hard. He tried to grin one of his usual goofy efforts, then saw the look in her face and it faded. Normally it would have worked, would have calmed the situation, made her reconsider the facts and her response to it. Her eyes narrowed, but not today. Every time I come home and see you there, she jabbed a trembling finger at him, and I see everything we used to be, everything we could have been, and everything we will never be again. Part of me hates myself for letting this happen, but not as much as it hates you for leading the way. He blinked. We shouldn't be like this, half screamed. He gawped. You promised me so much, she shook her head, trembling hand raised her mouth. The world, all my dreams, everything we planned for, things we could do together, but you have delivered so very little. Come on, he half raised an arm, about to sweep her up in an embrace. Don't, she snapped, backing away. You've messed up one too many times, and now I don't know if I want this anymore. She shook her head. Still, he said nothing. 
Why, was this your plan all along? String me along, get me to commit. She glared at the twinkling band of gold in her hand. Make me the bad cop all the time when it's you as at fault. She slowly shook her head, body turning ice cold, placing the ring down on a cabinet display with a glassy clink. I can't carry you anymore, Gary. I just can't. She felt her face crease up, turned and stalked for the door, wrenched it open, leaving the two marks and him in utter silence. <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> so many questions. That was so many. I lost oh, track of who was who in the middle there, but oh, you know, we are. That, that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. And the, yeah, so many questions. I need to go back now and read, read the. Yeah, you need to read your start. chapter now, but Delicious and Dragons I'm is out there now, I'm curious as to folks. why I'm smoking a cigar. That's brilliant. <laughs> How much fun was that? Well, thank you so much for sending it in and great reading as well, Mr. Stokes. Just like listening to an audio book. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> well, listen, folks, uh, you know, if you want to stick us a new novel, by all means, have some fun with it. <laughs> That's great, great comments there from Steve as well. Some nice little little uh, Easter eggs, shall we say. Yes. Um, brilliant stuff. Well, listen, folks, if you'd like to um, join us next week, you know where to find us. Uh, pop along to bestsellerexperiment.com and you'll find all the options there, socials on the bottom of the page. Subscribe, break review. Thanks to Dave and JD and find us on Facebook, Bestseller Experiment, Twitter, Instagram and threads is at Bestseller XP. Brilliant. So it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2 and those other two Marks, whoever they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the guy in the shop. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>